I'm coming. I gotta go fix that song. I gotta go fix that song. Well, good morning, friends. Thank you for joining us today. It's a beautiful, sunny morning after all the rain we've been having. Thank you for joining us online this morning, those that are joining us that way. Just a beautiful day to gather together and worship the Lord. Amen? Amen. Yes, I'm excited about that. This last week was an exciting week. We had VBS. I'm sure if you talk to Jess or others, they can give you some details of the week. It was a, a packed week. The, the building was full of kids and decoration, and it was just an exciting week. And uh, I just want to thank the church. Coming together like that to support that many kids and families throughout the entire week uh, it, and to decorate and, and take it all down and transform the church back is such an effort, and I just want to say thank you for that effort. It was truly a blessing. It really was a powerful VBS, so be praying for them kids. I think there was upwards of over 100 kids here throughout the week. And it was just a powerful week, so thank you for that. We have, um, there, there's an announcement this morning. On June 27th, we're going to be doing a highway pickup. I'm going to invite Julie Mertens up here. She's going to give a little bit of information about what that's going to look like. So I'm going to hand the mic off to her. For... 
Thank you. <clears throat> in Genesis it says, Then God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called the seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit that yields fruit, according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. We want to keep it good. So we've signed up and adopted two miles of highway on Highway 64 going north, just off of 210. So we are going to have the opportunity to keep that part of God's earth picked up and clean. Right now we have um, chosen, as Casey said, the 27th at 530. Of course, looking at the weather, it looks rainy. So we will we'll be flexible. But immediately following this service, there will be a little safety video. So if you are at all interested in ever helping pick up, doesn't have to be this Thursday, could be any, any of the other times that we do it, um, stay for that video and there will be more details there. This is open to anybody ages 12 and up. Uh, ages 12 to 17 have to have a permission slip signed by their parent. Uh, the DOT requires that. Uh, I have vests and we'll have the bags and we will gather at the church. But if you are interested at all, stay right after the service. There's a little five minute video. So encourage everybody who is able to to participate in this. Thank you. Some announcements this morning. If you got your bulletin handy, we got uh, we're back into the swing of things with VBS uh, behind us now. So Celebrate Recovery will be going on again tonight at 6 p.m. That's welcome to anyone that wants to attend. Bible Art Journaling will be going 6 p.m. on Monday evening, along with the Discipleship Training Class at 5 p.m. for those that are involved with that. Grief Share is still going on, so if you're interested in Grief Share, um, you can talk to Sherry about that. That's been a powerful ministry. Youth Group, of course, is going on. we got the, the 27th the Highway Pickup at 5.30, meeting here at the church. Certainly talk to Julie. Watch that video if you're interested in picking up that, uh, that section of road ditch and keeping, our, uh, keeping things cleaned up around here. Um, on Saturday, the 29th, is the Nolan Bacon Funeral here at 2 p.m., so make note of that. Uh, we'll probably need some hands, maybe some dishes. Talk to Sherry about that on the food side of things. But uh, that's what's going on there with that funeral. Wednesday evening service is still off. It will pick back up on the 3rd of July. Uh, we'll do it once a month throughout the summer to keep uh, the Wednesday evening service going. There's some other announcements there. You can kind of read through them. We're coming up on the 4th of July celebration coming up. Another community picnic, July 10th coming up. And then I want to highlight that July 21st baptism Sunday. If you're at all interested or maybe you've never been baptized or maybe you just feel it's time, talk to myself, talk to, to Jim. Uh, we will we'll give you the details on that. We're excited for that day. It's a huge celebration. We're always looking forward to baptism Sunday. So that's July 21st. So mark the calendar. If you're not planning on being baptized, I would encourage you to just be a part of that day. It truly is a celebration. Down further in the announcements, you can see the prayer focus. Lots of names, lots of just lots of hurts, lots of treatments, lots of cancer. There's just so much cancer on that list. If you read through it, we were praying for them last night. So be, be in prayer for that prayer focus in our uh, care center facilities, our local ministries, everything on that prayer focus. Just be bathing that in prayer. So speaking of prayer, let's, uh, let's go to the, word, uh, the Lord before we go any further. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for this house to come and worship and praise your holy name. Lord, we thank you for your grace, for your mercy, that we can come together. We can sing praises to you. We can open up the word, Lord, and you can speak to our hearts, continually transforming and working in each and every one, each and every one of us, Lord, as, as we come here to this morning to strengthen us and to build us up. We thank you for that. Lord, we thank you for our special guest and our speaker today, Lord. Fill him with your spirit, Lord, and that he can bring words from you directly to us, Lord, to fill our hearts. Open our ears, Lord, to that message. Lord, we thank you for our worship team that's going to guide us and lead us in song to your praise. All the teachers, the Sunday school teachers, the nursery care throughout this building, Lord, we ask for your, your presence just to move in mighty ways. Lord, we thank you for that, for there are local ministries around our area that are doing the same thing we are, glorifying your holy name. 
Lord, we lift up that prayer focus to you. There's so many names on there. Treatments and cancers and, and hurts and illnesses and, and broken bones. And Lord, the list is long. You know every circumstance. Lord, in their trial and their hurt that they're going through. Lord, I pray they're turning to you. I pray they know you as Lord and Savior as they go through these challenges. And Lord, I pray the body is coming alongside of them and praying for them and supporting them and helping in them in their time of need. Lord, we are just so thankful. We just vast in your, in your glory today as we come and worship on a Sunday morning. We love you, Jesus. We pray all of this in your holy name. Amen. I'm going to welcome up our worship team this morning. If you want to say hello and give a welcome to those sitting around you. wise. If you join us, you're all standing, so we'll just sing together. How about that?
let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we are able to gather here again on this glorious morning, Lord. Thank you, Father, for your presence with us this morning. Thank you for the peace that passes understanding. Thank you for opportunity to praise and sing to your holy name. We love you. We worship you this morning. We thank you for our guests this morning. We pray for the anointing, Lord, to rest on them. And for the words, Lord, those ancient words to flow to us, Lord Jesus, this morning from you. We love you. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Children going to Children's Church, you're dismissed. The adults, you have to stay. (laughs) No, you'll be glad you did. Today, our superintendent, Carl Brannon, and his wife, Kim, are here with us. And uh, they're dear friends of ours, and we're glad to have you. He's been our superintendent for some time. He's been busy. He doesn't get to Motley on Sunday. He's been here before, but to today is the first time he's got to be with us on Sunday morning. I asked him if he'd bring the word, and he's going to do that. And so I just uh, ask you to welcome. If you get a chance between the services, meet Carl and Kim. But uh, I want you to welcome this morning our superintendent, and we're going to hear from him. Let's welcome them this morning. Well, thank you for that welcome. Uh, It's truly a blessing to be here this morning. Um, If you haven't seen me, so I I just uh, started my second term as superintendent. If you haven't seen me, a lot of times that's good news. Uh, uh, So the the I have a pretty uh, pretty big territory of churches, and uh, if I'm if I need to be there often, it's usually because there's a problem uh, or there's a pastoral change and we're working through those things. So there's, But I want to just say it's just a blessing to be here. Um, I can say that uh, probably a little over four years ago, I couldn't have found Motley. Well, I could find it, but I didn't know where it was on the map. But I was told by Alan this morning, it's at the center of the universe, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, the known world, and so uh, I knew there was a reason that uh, Kim and I chose to be here on our anniversary. So uh, we're here to celebrate with you and to celebrate God's goodness. And I want to say, uh, uh, she's back there, Jessica, right? Yes, your worship set could not have, one of us was listening to the Holy Spirit, and it was, I think, you first, and then maybe me. Uh, just because of my message and the kinds of things on my heart, uh, that set was uh, was one that I would have had somebody choose in light of this. So it's so good to be here. And as Jim said, I've been through here a few times in the last few years, um, which is amazing because I had never been through Motley before. Uh, and w- one of those times, uh, intentionally, we spent some time together and had lunch, I think it was, uh, and uh, but other of those times I was passing through uh, up to Verndale and last just last year almost a year ago Kim and I were with a group of I think it was 50 or 60 bicyclists uh, that were traveling up to start a bike ride a 350 mile bike ride that began around Bemidji actually we began at the mouth of the Mississippi and then went up through Bemidji and then looped back around to towards Duluth and uh, uh, there was a remarkable time, but we rode right through, we drove right through Motley, and about a third of us got lost in Motley. Um, <laughs> and uh, I was following somebody with a, driving a bus uh, with a trailer, and somebody took a wrong turn, and on some narrow road we did a U-turn. Um, but uh, I said, hey, wait a minute, That's, I said to somebody next to me, there's, the, there's our Free Mother's Church right there, we're in Motley. And uh, I, should, I should also clarify that uh, the 350-mile bike ride, um, Kim rode the bike, <laughs> and, and I drove the bus. Um, so, but I had done a, one like that. We were with the Greenville Free Methodist Church, uh, kind of a final youth group uh, the, as a youth pastor was retiring. I had been on 
three others of those trips, one of them I rode, I think, 650 miles or something like that. So I, rode, I did ride one, and Kim was the last member of our family to do one of those bike rides, and she did a fantastic job. So we're so happy to be here in Motley. And as I was thinking about this, um, I was drawn to uh, Ephesians. Now, that's not where we're going to land today. Um, I think my ADD is kind of driving this message, and so we're going to uh, bounce around a few places. But I want to share a prayer from the book of Ephesians. You know, Paul wrote some amazing prayers for the church. And this is one that resonates with me as I think about Motley and the Free Methodist Church here. I'm going to read in verse, beginning in verse 15, uh, most of this here. It says, Ever since I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I just I want to say, I just give thanks for what God is doing in Motley, Free Methodist Church. And I give thanks for this body of believers who is faithful to the word, faithful to worship, faithful to reaching the community, faithful to missions. Uh, I just give thanks. And, and I have not stopped giving thanks for you and remembering you in my prayers. And I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. You know, uh, I'm thankful for what God is doing, but I am praying for more for you, for more. And I keep, uh, and I pray also that the eyes of your hearts may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which He has called you. And I pray that you may know the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints and that you may know his incomparably great power for us who believe. I am praying for more. I am praying for more. And I love the fact that in that prayer, Paul writes that he's praying for the minds to have wisdom and for the hearts to be transformed and for the Spirit of God to be made known through his people. It's a prayer for believers. And it's a prayer... Uh, that I believe is one the kind of prayer that I'm praying for many of our churches, but not all of our churches are in as healthy of a place as this church is. And the problem is, when you're in a healthy place, you can get comfortable, right? You can say, we're doing all right. We just had a VBS with over 100 kids. Well, that's enough. Isn't that good enough? Well, that, I think that the critical thing in the day in which we live is that God wants us to not be satisfied because there's more. There are more. As we sang earlier, the fields are ripe for harvest. And so, uh, again, as far as ministries in the conference go, I'm thankful for what God is doing here, and it's a blessing for me to be here um, this morning. And I've been asking the Lord, what word of encouragement and challenge would you have me give? And I just want to tell you, uh, I'm just going to be honest, one of the reasons this is one of my ADD messages where I'm bouncing all over the place is because I, I was wrestling for this message this week. Wrestling. Lord, what is the message? Where do you want me to focus? Where do you, what do you, and so I'm not quite sure where we're we're going to, well, I know where we're going to end up. So we're going to start with the ending. So I want to have you turn with me to Hebrews chapters uh, 11 and 12. And I'm going to start with the ending because I don't know where we're going to, where we're going to be in between there. So we're going to start with the ending in Hebrews chapter 12. Uh... I don't. I, I won't remember all the lyrics, but a little bit ago we were saying these, singing these are the days of Elijah, thinking about, you know, the forefathers, right, the heroes of the faith, and this is a text and this message is about those heroes of the faith, and I don't know who the heroes of your faith are. When I think of those who have gone before me and who have lived out this faith. I can think of a list of people I know, pastors that were kind of key pastors I looked up to, those who mentored me into ministry. I think of my, uh, f- my father's side of the family where most of the men were, were uh, called to ministry, full-time ministry. My grandfather, who um, uh, over the years I've heard numerous stories of the Spirit of God using him to bring somebody to faith or transform a life. Uh, somebody who, at the age of 93, 
uh, got asked to uh, come do a new, another job and took an assignment as a chaplain at a nursing home because he'd had such an impact there while he was visiting my grandmother for two or three years. So I can think of a list of those. My uncle, uh, uh, Uncle Elmer, who just passed last November, who as he was going through troubles and heart failure uh, in the uh, rehab and in the hospital, he and my aunt were uh, touching people's lives and drawing them. That, I, the, the, the heroes of the faith, I have some very personal connections, but also they're in the word here that we're going to look at. So Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and that's referencing back to Hebrews 11, the heroes of the faith, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. We sang... That a little bit ago. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. We're going to sing this, that also at the end of the service. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. These are days in which it's easy to grow weary and lose heart. Let's just be honest. All right? Um, and, uh, and I was thinking, so just to let you know how I think the Lord just, you know, didn't want me to be bound by my notes. I got up this morning and pulled open my briefcase and went in there to pull my notes out of the briefcase and I couldn't find them. And so I had to smooth talk the lady at the desk of the hotel and said, hey, I have a sermon to preach. Is there any chance I could get you to print this? And she was a little nervous because that wasn't their protocol. They didn't have a system for that. But she got something printed out. And whether I follow them or not, I've got some notes. So this morning, my challenge for us is to persevere. And not just to persevere, kind of holding on to, you know, uh, to survive, but to persevere with a drive to thrive and to do more and go deeper. So um, I was thinking again, uh, I, the only re- I wasn't going to mention my anniversary, but the reason I did is because I thought, you know, a, a marriage uh, is not based on one vow on one day. If your marriage is going to last 30, 40, 50 years, you say, I do more than once. And so I don't know what your spiritual journey is, and maybe you said yes to the Lord once, and maybe you said yes to a calling once. Maybe you said yes to kind of uh, a, a sacrificial or submission to a deeper thing once. But I'm here to tell you, you're not done yet. If you're living and breathing and sitting upright and, and can hear my voice right now, you are not done. And the Lord is not done. And so I just believe God is calling us to persevere. Now, uh, we have four kids, four adult kids. Our oldest, Anna, is 30 And in the last, I don't know, two years or so, Anna uh, took up uh, ultra trail running. Now, I did not know what that was exactly until Anna told us she was going to do this. And so in the last year, year and a half, she's run two 50K runs, which is longer than a marathon, uh, 30.1 miles or 31 miles through trails, and oftentimes with an incline, okay? So she's, that's what this is. And then we're driving up here yesterday, and I don't know how she did it. She started messaging the family, I guess, and, and had a picture of herself getting ready for another race and told, informed us that she was getting ready to start a race at midnight last night. And she was, it was a timed race for six hours, 
And you run these loops through these trails to see how many miles, how many loops you can get done. And she achieved her goal of four loops of 26 miles, basically 27 miles, and broke her personal record and finished at 6 a.m. this morning. Now, there's a little bit of insanity there. I don't really know all of that. But there's, it's been fascinating to talk to Anne about what it takes for her to pierce, persevere through the hard miles when she's ready to give up. And there's something about that. And you think about running a trail. Um, I mean, this is not just a flat surface. Uh, you think about running a trail, at night especially, with a headlamp, I'm sure, um, that you have to pay attention to every step and every route and every, she, she sent us pictures of two or three weeks ago. She and a friend just on a casual Saturday ran a half marathon through trails. And she had a picture of her friend wading through a creek that was flooded up to nearly her waist. And there's something you have to be determined about your end goal to persevere through a run like that. But you also have to just be at the same time focused on just what's right in front of you. And so Anna has these little things that she does to keep herself focused on a small enough section. I know I can do the next three. I know how I, three miles is a piece of cake for her. That would be like a marathon for me. But three miles is nothing for her. So she focuses on the next three miles, and she knows I can do three miles. And then one step at a time. And so I just want to say to you, The reason we get overwhelmed is because we focus on the whole mess that's before us, don't we? And we have a tendency to say, this is a messed up world we're in. You know, we watch the news. I watch the news regularly. Now, I want to tell you this. I watch the news because I feel like I need to know what is happening in the world. But I also watch international news because God has a global perspective. And he sees things that we're not really aware of much of the time. And I also pray the news. I don't let the news make me angry. Sometimes it gets there a little bit, but I pray the news. I figure if there's a mess, then it needs prayer. Okay? So, um, I want to just remind us of a couple of other things here. And uh, I've already left my notes. I don't know where I am here. But I want to. I want to. um, I want to talk about. I want to take you back to Hebrews ten, real quick, because I want what what the writer of the Hebrews does here, and we don't know. um, We really don't know. Scholars are not quite sure who wrote Hebrews. But what the writer of Hebrews is doing is he's pointing people back to their starting point, these followers of Christ who had been living out their faith in a time of persecution. And, And one writer has said that basically the New Testament letters are written primarily to churches that are Christians who were in exile. They may have been in their home territory, but they were living under another government rule that was not uh, uh, like, say, a Jewish Israel kind of context for the Jews. Um, but they were foreigners, aliens, several times in this passage of Hebrews 11 and 12. It speaks of for, we are foreigners and aliens in the world in which we live. You ever feel like that? Yeah, well, that's okay. That's the, that's the way the Christian journey has been since the beginning of the, of the church. And the writer of Hebrews is reminding them that in verse 32 of chapter 10, he says, Remember those earlier days after you had received the light when you stood your ground in the great contest in the face of suffering? Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution, and other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You sympathize with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive 
what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay, but my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. But we are not those who shrink back and are destroyed, but we are those who believe and are saved. So the writer of Hebrews is saying, do you remember what you were like when you first came to faith? And you said, I, it doesn't matter what they throw at me, I can take it. I'm, not, I, I, I'm even willing to sacrifice my stuff, all the things that give me security and identity. And I am willing to suffer, and I am willing to stand with others who suffer. Because I'm that convinced that the gospel message and the gospel transformative work of the gospel in my life is the most important thing there is. And I want to share that. And so he's, he's uh, um, calling the believers to continue to persevere. Remember where you, what you were like when you first started this. And I remember, and, and occasionally I revisit this, I remember my calling when I said, yeah, Lord, I will go wherever you call me. I remember in, I think it was 2002 or something like that, when I was in a conference and somebody spoke a word. You've ever been in one of those places when you felt like that word was directly to you? And he said, uh, you know, some of you are called to get a passport right now. So that whenever God calls you to some place, you're ready. And I want to tell you, I, I, at that time, I did not have a passport. I had no plans of getting a passport. I didn't have plans of travel. I didn't have any idea or thought that I... But I knew that what he was saying was a message for me. Now, I, I'm also going to be honest and say, I didn't go get a passport. But a year later... Somebody in our church, one of the laymen in our church, started to organize a trip, a missions team trip to Ghana, West Africa. And as soon as he started organizing it, I said, okay, I've got to go. And that means I'm a little late. I should have got that passport. So I started getting the passport, and I got my passport. And we went on this trip to Ghana, West Africa. And I want to tell you that almost everything that could go wrong on that trip did go wrong on that trip. So we, uh, I think there were 10 of us that went on this trip. And, you know, we did all the trip planning, all the normal stuff. We knew where we were going. We had this, we were going to partner with a, a new church, Free Methodist Church there. And uh, Pastor Charles, who he had secured this territory, remarkable territory that looked out over the bay where thousands of slaves were boarded on ships to come to the West. Just profound to be in that text context and, and, and look out over that. And we were going there to help them lay the foundation for this church building, or school, I think, school and church. And so um, 10 of us uh, got on uh, the, the flight and flew to New York. And then New York, we boarded Ghana Airways flight uh, and it was a packed flight. We didn't realize it at the time, but it was the time of the year when, when everybody would return to Ghana. Uh, th- those who were from Ghana that lived here in the States would return to visit family and those kinds of things. So it was, a, it was the highest time of travel there. Flew to Ghana. We got, arrived in Ghana. There's a whole lot more to this story. But we arrived in Ghana, and seven out of ten of us did not have luggage. You know, they warn you when you uh, go on a trip like that. They say, take a carry-on, and in your carry-on, make sure you have a change of clothes and all your toiletries and anything you desperately might need. And the leader of our group didn't do that. And he didn't have anything. So he, he, uh, uh, he, he even put his carry-on in the check bags. And so he was there with nothing. I remember him wrapped in a sheet uh, the first day we were there because his clothes were being laundered so he'd have something to wear the next day. As, and I thought, this is, this, is, uh, this is how missions ought to go. <laughs> um, when we got there also that first day or so, we realized that we could, we could not 
um, we didn't have the proper permits. The people there did not have the proper permits for us to do the project that we were there to do. And so um, we <laughs> we were just trying to. We were going to be also be doing some services that at night, so we could at least do the services and invite the people in the neighborhood to come to the services. There's so many things around this whole trip that that even as I'm thinking about it now are pretty just remarkable. But um, what we also did is we began to pray around that property. And, um, and the pastor there, Pastor Charles, and I were walking together, and he reached out and he grabbed my hand, and we walked around and led this prayer team around the property of uh, this, where the school was going to be, again, overlooking the bay where thousands of slaves had been loaded on ships, and I'm sure many of them died in the journey, and being brought to the West. And uh, so there was something remarkable about these African uh, people uh, leading us and participating with these clearly non-African people walking around this property that was very publicly uh, uh, displayed. And as we walked around that property, and Pastor Charles and I held hands, and in our culture... It is not a natural, comfortable thing for two guys to walk and hold hands like that. And I was aware that there are other cultures where that's a very common thing, and that was one of them. And it was interesting because as we finished walking, or somewhere later in the walk, Pastor Charles says, I want to thank you that you have held my hand as we've walked and done this prayer journey because... That, that is a symbol in our culture of, of love and care and belonging. And it's, it's, it's modeled something even as we've done this. And I didn't have any plan other than I knew if he didn't let go, I wasn't going to let go. The other thing about that trip was, um, there's a, and there's a whole lot more I'm not going to just be able to tell you, but uh, the other thing about that trip that's significant for you to know is I think it was the second day there that the uh, guest house where we were staying, the guy said, uh, so have you guys read the newspaper um, here? And we said no. And he brings us a newspaper, uh, and he said, you came on Ghana Airways, right? And we said, yeah. And the newspaper article said that Ghana Airways had been shut down by the FAA. And remember, this is the busiest season of travel back and forth to Ghana. And so we realized that we were, our flights back were canceled. And that's why our luggage never arrived. They kept telling us, it'll be here tomorrow, it'll be here tomorrow. And so we began to make phone calls, and our family members began to make phone calls and trying to figure out, and they said, yeah, we can get you out of there in three months. <laughs> We had somebody who said they could get us out of there in about a month and a half. And my wife was at home with four small children. <laughs> I was not communicating directly with her this information because I wanted her to not know everything <laughs> that I knew. Now, God worked it out, and we got out of there roughly in the time that we were supposed to. Um, but there was one other thing that the Lord did there, and that was, so since our project was kind of scrapped, they said, you know, we have, um, we have a stone wall that we're, we need to work on to finish raising up around the property here, and it kind of this establishes that this is our territory. And they said, uh, would you be willing to work with African masons who are building that stone wall? And so we said, absolutely, we'll do whatever you want. And so basically what happened was we became the servants of the African masons to build a wall in a very public place overlooking the bay where thousands of African slaves had been, had been loaded onto ships by Europeans to go west. That was a prophetic, that was a prophetic witness to the people there that in God's eyes, we all 
are the same. It was powerful. Yeah. And that was not why we went to Ghana. But that was why we went to Ghana. Right? Um, I want to just... I'm going to bring us back to this perseverance and a couple of things about that. But I want to just talk about the, the, some observations I have about Christianity in in America. Um, I think, by and large, we've had it easy. For, for many years, for many years, it has been acceptable, if not fashionable, to at least be a believer and go to church. And the Judeo-Christian values were, for the most part, culturally acceptable. Uh, so we could live a pretty comfortable casual faith without really the kinds of opposing pressures that take place around most of the world. And now we know over the past 40 years or so this has been shifting, and and in the past 10 years it has shifted dramatically. And that has been painful for us. But I think that in the process of, as we've processed through that, that we have perhaps had the wrong approach in how we understand and deal with that. And so I want to talk a little bit about what I think the Lord is trying to do. But before I talk about that, I want to say what I think that he's not focused on as far as answering the problems in our culture today. And this is what I think he's not focused on. Politics and politicians and political parties and even the Supreme Court. Now, we have one of the greatest systems in the world. I believe that. And we are a blessed people. And I'm grateful for my country. And this is not an anti-anything other than this is a who we are message. We are not first and foremost Americans. You and I as believers in Jesus, are first and foremost kingdom people. And um, I'm convinced that God's priority is not making America great. His priority is building his kingdom. And that sometimes... We lose the kingdom because of the things that we think we deserve. We're all a little bit entitled. I know that we say that about certain generations. But I want to just say that we all have some of that to deal with. This is... Please don't miss this. This is not a political statement. This is a kingdom message. Another thing that is not going to fix this is social media shouts back and forth. I think of the way that much of the church, much of Christian good friends of mine, folks in our conference, some of our pastors, that the way much of our response has been has missed the point. I think it's been like appealing to uh, chariots and horses that King David spoke about in Psalm 20 and other parts of Scripture, it's referenced as well. In Psalm 20, there's this incredible prayer of King David, a prayer of dependence upon God for rescue, for protection, for support, and for care. And it concludes with the specific distinction between the kingdom under the reign of God and the rest of the worldly kingdoms that are out there. And at the end of Psalm 20, and verse 7, he said, Some trust in chariots and some in horses but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. 
And I think our emphasis on politics and politicians and political parties and our, our attention to shouting out our perspective on a social media or some other public means are like the chariots and horses of our days. We're looking to the resources of humanity to fix a spiritual problem. And God has called us to something deeper. And God is convinced that he's got something better. And is the church. And so, and I want to give you a little bit more perspective on that horses and chariots thing. Just because I kind of got hammered by it this this week. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14 through 17, uh, there's this picture of the people of God going into the promised land. And it's, and it's this message that's coming to uh, Moses and it says, the king, by the way, when you get settled, when you take the land and you're settled in the land and you're prospering and you're blessed and you have uh, established this promised kingdom, he says, the king that you have, he says, you know, I don't, really don't want you to, be a, to have kings, but you're going to say we want to have kings like the rest of the world. And he says, so here's my instructions for the king that you choose. The king must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more horses. Because that's what other kingdoms do. And the king must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. Now, you know, we, that one we say, uh, yeah, we get that one, right? And he must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. Because that's what other kings do to prove how powerful they are. And that's to, to kind of build themselves up. And the, as I'm reading this and thinking about these things for this morning, our devotion two days ago, as we go through the one-year Bible, our devotional went to the description in, is it First Kings, Kim, where we were with, I don't remember, First Kings, and it's talking about uh, Solomon, David's son, and the description of all the chariots and horses he had, and all the gold and silver he had, and how all the wives... He had. And one generation, one generation after King David, we know what happened, right? So so this morning, we look back at our heroes of the faith. We remember what it was like when we first accepted the gospel, and gave our lives to Christ. And we said, yes, Lord, send us anywhere, even to Africa. Or in my case, India, and Bolivia, and Chile. Um, The several places the Lord has taken me that I never had on my bucket list. And... And when we were people who said, send us anywhere, we surrender our stuff, our lives, our future. We we revisit that and we renew our vows this morning. In a sense, I wanna I wanna invite you to a vow a vow renewal this morning. I don't have time to uh, read through all of chapter 11. So I'm going to ask you to do that. That's your assignment today. Read through 11. I was going to focus on Abraham, but I'm going to read just this one, this one passage where it's talking about these, these incredible people, uh, these, these people who kind of, kind of showed us what faith was like in the Old Testament. And it doesn't cover all of them. But in verse 13 it says, All these people are still, were still living by faith when they died. And they did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had an opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country. And I would say a better place, a better kingdom. 
a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And I would say we also can real quickly look at Hebrews chapter 10, where it says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, that's, we can enter the holy place here. Jesus paved the way for us to enter the most holy place in prayer and worship by the blood of Jesus, by a new living hope, open for us through the curtain. That is his body. Since we have a great priest over the house of God, then here's, here's some handles for us. What, how do we do this? Let us first draw near to God. In verse 22, with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pearl water. Let us first draw near to God. Then verse 23, look at these let us uh, statements. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope. Remember Paul's prayer earlier that we would know the hope, that we would really know the hope to which we're called. And that, that we that we let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess, for it's not in anything else other than Jesus Christ and Him crucified, and the hope of eternity. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, and let us not give up meeting together. How many people gave up meeting together since COVID? Now, let's not turn that into a political battle over whether we should or shouldn't have been shut down or not. But the problem is that people stopped, and many have not restarted. And let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So no matter how bad it seems out there, let us encourage one another that we are kingdom people with an eternal hope and a living mission today. Kim and I uh, were able to attend a conference uh, on, on, it was originally a ch- conference on church planting, but it was a, the emphasis was on also discipleship, church planting and, and reaching people in the world that we live in today. And uh, a couple of the presenters were incredibly profound for us, but one of them was, a, um, one of them was an African man, and I'm not going to remember from what country, who God had called to make a major stand against Uh, some injustices in his country and how he had answered that call. And um, as a result of that, that he brought this small nation together and they had a a one-day kind of like everybody went on strike for a day. And it profoundly began this transformational process in in that country. And as a result of it, he was instantly thrown in prison miraculously got out of prison and got out of the country, and God called him back. And he knew that if he went back, that he was definitely going to prison and he could die. But he went. And miracle after miracle after miracle of God using him and showing him things and doing remarkable things. And we went away from that that particular message just humbled and said, would we do that? I don't know. I don't know. And then we heard another presenter from the Ukraine. Uh, A seminary uh, president in Ukraine who talked about when the war broke out in Ukraine. And he talked about all kinds of stuff, both the good and the bad things in the history of Ukraine. And he talked about how God has been stirring revival in Ukraine through this horrific war. And um, folks, when you watch the news, would you pray? Would you pray for those people? And then I was at a meeting with superintendents when our um, Middle East area director shared right at the very beginning of the conflict in Palestine. And he said, you know, one of our strongest ministries in the Middle East right now is amongst the Palestinians and our pastors. And so we were offering ways to get our pastors and leaders out of the, out of the Middle East so they wouldn't be caught in the conflict and none of them would leave. And I'm thinking to myself... Kingdom. 
You know, I'm uncomfortable with things that are going on in the world we live in. Kim's a school teacher. She's not teaching full-time now. She's subbing. She's in rural schools, urban schools, Christian schools she's been in, public schools. There's a mess in our families. And who has the hope that they need? We do. And what price are we willing to pay to present that hope? to the messed up, lost, confused, offensive. <laughs> uh, I could come up with all kinds of adjectives. How can, would God call his people in this day to live as aliens, strangers in our homeland because we're a kingdom people? These are the days of Elijah. Elijah. And we have a message of hope. And Motley from Methodist Church, I want to thank you for what you're doing, but I want to say don't get content. And don't, pick, don't look to chariots and horses. Let's be God's kingdom people, willing to live out a prophetic witness to the world that desperately needs to see people who love one another deeply, who pray passionately, and who have a message that can change the world. That's who we are. And that's who our God is. Let me pray, and we're going to sing. Father in heaven, um, my prayer this morning is that, that... that whatever message you have for each of us, including me, whatever message you have for each of us, that we would receive it and say yes. That if you're calling us even just to pray more or, or, or to look at the news differently or to cancel social media or to, just to walk across the street to the neighbor that's driving us crazy and say, we love you. Lord, I don't know what the step of obedience is. Thank you for a VBS where a number of those children are not church kids. Lord, I pray that the Spirit of God would be just poured out in those little hearts and minds as it was this week, that they would, they would receive all of that and that their families and their homes might be transformed by it. And Lord, I pray that you would raise up missionaries, pastors, Sunday school teachers, youth group leaders. I don't know what the greatest needs are. People who, in their workplace, who would be seen as unique. Lord, would you call us? Would you call us afresh? Because we will say, I do. I will. Send me. And may you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to close with a hymn called Like a River Glorious.
Thank you, Superintendent. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness and your grace. Help us to be stayed upon you, just like we sung. Stayed upon you, trusting you, looking to you, the author and finisher of our faith. Thank you for our superintendent's message and challenge. Help us to absorb it deeply, ponder it fully, and seek you as to know what you would have for us, each of us, next. Go with each one here, Lord, into this day, into this week, into classes, into travel, into celebration, whatever it is. May we always be stayed upon Jehovah, our Heavenly Father, and guide each of us to a closeness to you that's transformational, real, and eternal. We pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen.